You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 17. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, we've got a couple of topics this week. We're going to be talking about air drying, and we're going to be talking about turning your cheese. Not only turning your cheese when it's air drying, what a coincidence, but uh, when we're maturing the cheese. So firstly, let's talk about air drying. Now, air drying is quite essential for um, semi-hard to hard cheeses, and what the, um, the home hobbyist or home cheese maker needs to do, they need to air dry their cheese and cheeses like uh, kefili that I make, cheddars and, and, and those sorts of cheeses, they n- typically need about uh, two to three, maybe four days, uh, sometimes up to five, um, depending on the moisture in the air, the humidity. Uh, and what it does, it, it dries the outside of the cheese so that it is less susceptible to mould. So what we do normally is uh, during those two to three days, we turn it every six hours and um, and hope that the sides dry. Now let's um, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and hopefully make that a little bit more easier for you guys. And just be known that um, commercially in factories, they actually blow cold air uh, over the cheeses and make them dry out really quickly. So, uh, so we don't have that choice really. Um, so what we're going to try and do is uh, after we take our cheese out of the press, we usually put it on some sort of mat. Now make sure that the uh, what you're putting it on is um, uh, not impervious to water. So don't put it on flat on a, a wooden chopping board to air dry. Uh, the whey will pull. Same if you put it on, say, a ceramic plate or something like that. The whey is just going to pull and the bottom is not going to dry and that's going to make it more susceptible to uh, moulds and yeasts. Uh, growing on your cheese and also if it stays too moist too long then you'll get uneven drying if you if you do manage to dry the cheese. Now another problem is if it dries too quickly what can happen is that the insides stay moist and they expand uh, where the uh, the rind is contracting too fast and it splits your cheese. I've had that happen uh, with some kefillis that are heavily salted uh, if I let them air dry too long, uh, then typically they do split. And it's a bit hard to recover from that. Uh, the only way I've managed to do it in the past is to simply wax that cheese straight away uh, and you don't have too much problems. So, uh, you know, wipe it over with a a, a, a cloth that's soaked in brine uh, and then uh, just uh, pat that dry with some uh, paper towel and then, and then wax that cheese. And hopefully you've kept all the moulds out of the inside of the cheese and it should mature okay. But let's try and avoid that. So you don't want to keep the cheese on, on say, um, plastic matting that has its weaving too close. Uh, that won't allow for the cheese to dry evenly on the bottom. Also, if you you put it on a wire rack, it'll probably, uh, and I mean a, like a, a, a baking, like you put cookies and, 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 and biscuits on uh, that let them cool down. That is probably too extreme. It would make the cheese dry too quickly and probably crack again uh, what I find is the best the best solution or one of the better solutions is a bamboo sushi mats and bamboo sushi mats can be used all I do when I um, when I start my cheese making session is when I'm sanitizing the pot I throw in uh, two or three sushi mats into there and they actually are then sanitized so I've killed all the molds and yeasts uh, pop them in a plastic bag after they've air dried uh, to keep any other uh, moulds off. And then after I've removed the cheeses from the moulds and the press, then I put them on the, the clean sushi mats onto a wooden board. And I find that in two or three days, no problems. You've got even drying and the surface is a dry to touch, which is essentially what we're after before we wax a cheese, if we're going to wax it, uh, or before we're going to put it into the cheese cave at a high humidity um, and then possibly oil it or um, or keep brining it, uh, wiping it with a, a briny solution on a cloth. 
Now, you're probably wondering what temperature and how long for. Well, the best temperature for uh, air drying your cheese is around 21 degrees Celsius, so room temperature uh, in Fahrenheit, that's 72 Fahrenheit. And you're looking at most houses these days, unless they've got the air conditioner running, uh, will be about 70 to 75% humidity. So uh, make sure that your cheese is not in a draft, that it's in a, a still air. Um, because the uh, if it's in front of an open window or a fan, that's going to dry too quickly and crack. If temperatures are above that, they're going to dry a lot quicker. If temperatures are below that, they're going to take uh, a little bit longer. And same as the humidity, if it's too hum uh, if it's too humid, it'll take a bit longer. If it's not as humid, if it's say below uh, sixty to fifty percent humidity then what you can do, and I've done this before, is put a stainless steel bowl that's probably double the size of the cheese over the top of the cheese. And that stops all airflow and increases the humidity a little bit. Uh, and your cheese won't crack. It'll dry naturally. So that's air drying. So one of the problems when air drying is that what we can do, is we can actually damage the cheese when we turn it. So let's talk about turning the cheese now. There are a couple of methods because there are a couple of ways of um, forming our cheeses. So uh, a lot of people ask me about camembert uh, and brie and, and soft cheeses. So uh, when, when you turn unpressed cheeses, uh, you do so in the mould that you put them in. There, there is usually a cheese hoop or a camembert hoop or a brie hoop, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you use two plastic mats or two bamboo mats, um, sushi mats like I use. And uh, you make sure one's at the top, one's at the bottom. And when you flip it, you flip it like you're turning a pancake. Uh, and usually the cheese then drops in the mould and maintains its skin. So make sure that when you do it, you make it sure it's really quickly. Uh, and then uh, the cheese will, will form a better shape as it loses some way. So that is for unpressed cheeses. For cheeses that have been pressed, uh, so semi-hard to hard cheeses, basically when you put it into the mould for the first time, usually you're only pressing it for between you know 10 to maybe 15 minutes just to get it into a form that you can then turn it again. It's, 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 it expels whey very quickly uh, during this initial period. So what you can do is make sure when you unwrap it for the first time after that 10 or 15 minutes that you treat it with kid gloves. You really do have to treat it tenderly because it's only just formed its shape. So you gently hold it with both hands and then turn it over uh, onto the mat and then rewrap it and then put it back in. Now after all the press, the next time it's a lot easier and you don't have to be um, tiptoe around your cheese gingerly. So just make sure that when you pull it out of the mould for the last time, you don't handle it too roughly, of course, and uh, then you air dry as per the methods that I um, talked about a minute ago. Now, lastly but not leastly, and this is something I've just done recently, is brined a uh, Romano. And, uh, and you've got to make sure when you're pulling the cheese out of the brine, because a fully saturated brine, which is about 26% uh, salt to water ratio, the cheese will float and, and most of the time the cheeses are, are, are less dense than the salt so the cheese will actually float on top of the cheese, uh, sorry the cheese will float on top of the brine uh, and you'll get a little bit sticking out. I actually have a, a plastic, uh, it, it's a bit of plastic mesh and it actually um, holds the cheese under the water but you, when, you, when you do have those cheeses you've got to make sure that you turn those cheeses in the brine, so I ch turn them about every six hours if I'm brining for uh, more than six hours. So, but make sure that when you do it though, um, the best way I find is to push the cheese into the brine pot, so push it down and then flip it over when it's underwater uh, under the brine. Um, if you lift it, what could happen, uh, and it has happened to me before, is that that the surface can crack and you can get far too much salt into your cheese during brining uh, and it is over salted and, and doesn't taste very nice. So that's the best way and when you do pull it out, pull it out with both hands, put it both hands around the cheese and, and pull it out 
um, and then place it onto the sushi mat to dry for you know a few hours. And with those sorts of cheeses, you pop them straight into the cheese fridge because they need to stay hard. Uh, and because they've been salted in a brine bath, they dry out very quickly in the uh, in the cheese cave. So that is methods of air drying and turning your cheeses. I've had quite a few questions of, about those that part of cheese making um, from listeners and uh, learning curd nerds out there. So I've got a news article here. This is a bit gross, but uh, it has a lot to do with cheese. Uh, it's from the uh, website called Geekwinox. I'll put the address up in the show notes, but Geekwinox. And uh, it talks about scientists make cheese from armpit sweat and toe jam. Wonderful. Okay, uh, let me just read a little bit here. It's a bit crazy. Uh, For those who really like a good stinky cheese, one that smells as much like feet as possible, an exhibition at Dublin Science Gallery might be exactly what they're looking for. But for most of us, it'll probably just end up making us feel queasy. Self-made as an exhibit of different stinky cheeses that tries to show us how the bacteria we live with every day aren't necessarily a bad thing. The pieces in the art in the exhibition start off the cheese making process like any other. But when it comes to adding that special something to give them their unique bouquet and flavour, cheesemakers go no further than their own bodies. Yes, that's right. The bacteria they use in the cheeses isn't your standard lactobacillus. Instead, it's swabbed from human armpits, belly buttons and even between the toes. A bit gross. Anyway, I'll put there's a video that goes with that, and I'll put that into the show notes. Um, unique, so bacteria that is all around us uh, is not necessarily bad bacteria. So it uh, it gives a new meaning to um, to cheesy mold. That's for sure. Anyway, I've got one uh, other little clip of um, news, and this is uh, from our favourite state in the United States, or Wisconsin. Um, so let's just play that now. Milwaukee may be taking the America's Dairyland image to a new level, using a byproduct from cheese production to cope with another Wisconsin icon, ice and snow. This is 95 salt. Cheesemaker Lenny Zimmel gives us a look at the nearly century-old Whitmer's cheese cellars in Theresa, makers of handcrafted cheeses. The mild brick is the yellow, and then the aged brick is the white. And it's this byproduct of cheesemaking, the super salty brine water, that the city of Milwaukee is eyeing as a way to minimize their salt use and take a waste product off the hands of the cheesemakers. I think it's an excellent idea. Yeah, uh, another place for it to be utilized uh, where it wouldn't be going back into the system. Master cheesemaker Joe Widmer says the cheese brine would have to be filtered somewhat to remove any solids or fats before it could be sprayed on the roads using equipment similar to the sprayers already in use for the water salt mix that's a common preventative measure ahead of snowstorms. Widmer says his process already reuses most of his brine, so he couldn't provide much help to clear roads, but suspects bigger manufacturers would be glad to unload some. We use a higher uh, salt content, so we're, we're able to pasteurize it, and reuse it, and just remove the solids. Uh, for a lot of other guys, uh, it, it would be a problem, so it would be good to utilize it on the highways. And Milwaukee's pilot program this winter will study uh, using that cheese brine on a small scale. But we've obtained this study that the city has done. And according to the feasibility study, it's thought that using the brine could one day amount to a reduction in salt use here by as much as 30% or about 17,000 tons. Well, that is amazing. So using the brine that they soak their cheeses in, um, they're going to experiment in Milwaukee. And, uh, and clear the roads of snow and sleet. Well, quite amazing anyway. So now it's time for reader questions. And oh, I've got a lot. I don't have any voicemails from anybody. So if anybody wants to leave me a voicemail, pop over to littlegreencheese.com. On the right-hand side, there is the speak pipe 
uh, tab and that'll pop out and you will be able to leave me a voicemail from any computing device that has a microphone. So please leave me a voicemail question. Uh, I love to get them and I love to reply to them um, here via the podcast and I'll, I'll leave a little courtesy thing on your uh, return your voicemail and tell you that it's going to be on the podcast and which episode. Anyway, so we've got some um, some questions, and this one comes from Randy Adams, and Randy Adams, I think, was in one of the recent uh, podcasts, uh, and he was asking me about um, a whole bunch of cheese questions. So this one is a, an email, it says, uh, Gavin, I wanted to thank you for asking answering my voicemail concerning curd sizes a couple of episodes back. Uh, not only did it bring a clarity to the great world of cheese, but it also made me feel like a true curd nerd. No, Randy, you are a curd nerd. Lately, I have contemplated the process of extracting vegetable rennet from whatever plant it is derived from. I was wondering if you have developed any experience in this area yet. Doing research, I found that people have actually made wild rennet from plants like cardamom, nettles, thistles, uh, with each having different sets of enzymes and properties for setting different kinds of cheeses. Anyway, he goes on to leave a, 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 a link, and I'll post that in the show notes. Now, to answer your question, Randy, uh, no, I don't have any experience in making my own, um, my own rennet. However, I do have a friend in Canada. Uh, his name is Ian. And Ian has tried to make his own rennet uh, with a little bit of success. And uh, his blog is called Much To Do About Cheese. Um, And I will put the link to the post that he wrote about making his own rennet into the show notes. So hopefully that answers your question, Randy, and you can see some of the great things that Ian's done on his blog as well. So the next question comes from Ida, who calls herself the Enabling Cook. Uh, says, Dear Gavin, I've learned so much from your blog, ebooks, and videos. I currently have your Cotswold with chives and onions aging in the cheese cage. Cage. Cave. <laughs> it's been almost six weeks, so I'm looking forward to cracking it open soon. Yesterday I made the Italian bag cheese from your ebook. I like the basic taste of the cheese, but it is so salty. So salty. You say it's a very briny, uh, very salty brine, and that it is. Is it possible to reduce the salt in the brine without harming the cheese? Or is it possible I did something wrong? I did weigh the salt. Oh, I would like to try the Pyrenees style cheese from your YouTube channel. I see you got out of a book. Which book did you use? Thank you. I'm looking forward to possibly some more video tutorials. Ida. Well, thank you, Ida, for your question. Um, In relation to the Italian bag cheese, yes, you can lower the salt content of your brine. That is no hassle. You just have to eat the cheese quicker. So if you, say, only use half the amount of salt in your brine uh, and brine it for the same amount of time, then make sure that you devour that cheese um, a lot quicker um, because it does not have as much salt that is... Um, controlling the uh, lactobacillus bacteria from multiplying and making the cheese more acidic. Now, as for the Pyrenees-style cheese or Osuarati, uh, that cheese recipe is in my it's in my cheese book. Um, so you can have a look in uh, my cheese book. You can go to uh, littlegreencheese.com and uh, go to the my cheese book tab up the top. And it's called uh, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. And that has that recipe and many, many of the recipes that I list for free on the blog. In fact, I think it might even be on the blog. So just go and have a look there at littlegreencheese.com. And thanks very much for your question, Ida. Now, I've got another question here, and this one is from Floris. And Floris says, Hi there, Gavin. Thank you for your podcasts. It has given me the confidence to try and make my own cheese. Today was my very first attempt. I bought a cheese making kit and tried to make feta to see how I'd do. Things went okay, but my curds didn't set properly. But I soldiered on and put 
what I could in some feta molds. I remember you talking about putting curds in a cheesecloth and hanging it on a stick between two chairs. So I put the curds that were too small to scoop out, which was quite a bit, in some cheesecloth and hung it between two chairs. What do you think I can do with the leftovers? Thank you for your time and hope to hear from you soon. Sent from my iPad. Well, thank you very much, Floris, for your your email. Really, um, you won't be able to make feta out of it. Uh, and you probably haven't by now because I did actually reply back to your email. Uh, you can save it and probably turn it into a nice ricotta or a cream cheese because it does have a starter culture in it. If you hang that and drain a fair bit of the whey out of that uh, and then add a little bit of salt, maybe uh, a teaspoon, uh, maybe a teaspoon and a half of cheese salt to that, mix that through thoroughly, um, it could make a very nice cream cheese which could be eaten straight away. That would be no hassle. Also, it'll make a very nice dip, a very nice cheese dip. Um, So you could use it as that. It it would make a a, a quite a strong ricotta if you're going to use it in dishes that call for ricotta because it will have that cheesy flavour. Now to store that, it's probably best to store it in an airtight plastic container in the normal fridge at around 4 degrees Celsius. And that'll last for about a week. So hopefully that's answered your question, Floris. I have another question here, and this is from Neil. Um, Not sure where Neil's from. Uh, It says, hello, Gavin. First off, I wanted to thank you for sharing all your knowledge. I truly enjoyed your cheese-making videos. I just started into the cheese-making world and decided to jump into the deep end right away. I decided to start with your Stilton recipe. Yes, you are jumping into the deep end there, Neil, but uh, we'll read on. The biggest issue I had with the make was the milk temperature. I used a double boiler and didn't do a good job of controlling the temperature, and it got up to 100 Fahrenheit at one point, uh, which is 38 degrees Celsius, after turning the heat off at 85, so it crept up a fair bit. And I ended up having to move the vat with the milk back and forth from the boiler to keep to try and keep the temperature in range. Not knowing what the increasing milk temperature would do to the cheese, I decided to proceed on and the cheese will be going into the cave in a few days. What should I expect from the cheese due to the increased temperature? Well, if I remember rightly, Stilton uses mesophilic culture. A mesophilic culture has a life range, or it, it, it is active. It's between about 28 degrees Celsius and 38 degrees Celsius. So that's up to 100 Fahrenheit. So I think you're within, just within range. Uh, and uh, Neil actually did send me a follow-up email, uh, and he showed me a picture of his Stilton after four days um, air drying. And the uh, Penicillium Roke 40 certainly survived because it's all over the cheese, which is great, just what he needs. Uh, and he wants to know how to determine whether the mesophilic culture survived. Really, the only way is to uh, taste it after a little while. But I think uh, it'll even, even if the mesophilic did get retarded in some manner because of the high heat, then no problem really because it will still have a cheese flavour. The Penicillium Roke 40 will be very strong. Um, But look, proceed with it, and I don't think you'll have too much of a problem. It just won't have too much of an overbearing cheesy flavour, so no big deal. So, next question. Uh, This one's from Nirvana, and Nirvana says, uh, Thanks for your halloumi recipe. Do you know how many grams of cheese you ended up with from 8 litres? Well, it actually ended up, I did weigh all nine pieces that I got out of the halloumi from using 8 litres, and it was about 980 grams. So that's 2.3 pounds uh, of cheese. So that's, uh, that's about standard for, um, for, for 8 litres of milk or just over 2 gallons. So not too bad at all. And the last question comes from Kathleen Brown. And she's got lots of questions here, but I'll just read out the first bit. Hi, Gavin. If I use boiled rainwater, do I still use calcium chloride or penicillium candidum? And where will I be able to get it from a chemist? I think she's talking about making... uh, She's making camembert here, I think. Um, No, you can't buy calcium chloride or penicillium candidum from chemists here in Australia. 
Um, and I assume you're from Australia. Yeah, you're .com.au. Yep. Now, you have to buy them from a cheese supplier. Uh, unfortunately, I don't supply those. I only supply full kits, so a soft cheese making kit and a hard cheese making kit, which is packaged up for me by a third party and then sent out. So um, I don't have the individuals unless you live here in Melton, then I can um, I can grab them for you, but I assume you don't. So one of the one of the better suppliers that I use is uh, Green Living Australia, uh, and you can find their I think it's GreenLivingAustralia.com.au, and they have individual rennets and individual um, calcium chloride and and penicillin candidum and, and all those goodies that you'll need for for cheese so you can just pop over there um and then she goes on to say um uh, thank you very much for reading me uh, i got your i think your site is great and we'll spend more time on it another day cheers and hope to hear from you soon kathy brown well thanks very much kathy um hopefully i've answered your questions and you learn a little bit about uh, cheese making i hope you really enjoy that <laughs> Well, that's about all we've got time for today. The podcast has run over time. Normally, I try to keep it to about 20 minutes. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. We can answer as many questions as we like. And thanks very much for sending them in. If you want to send in some more questions, please feel free via email. Uh, my email address is gavin at littlegreencheese.com. Um, or as I said, um, and uh, a great way to get some airtime for yourself and get some notoriety on the uh, Little Green Cheese podcast is to use my SpeakPipe account, uh, and that is on the littlegreencheese.com website, and it's on the right-hand bar. You'll see that there it pops out, and you'll be able to record a message for me. Just make sure that the message is clear, because I've had one or two where I really couldn't understand what people were saying because the recording was a little bit iffy. I think there's a, 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 a feature in SpeakPipe where you can play it back to yourself and then send it if it's okay. Just please just have a listen to the, the recording uh, before you send it off. But yeah, I love the recordings. I love playing them on the podcast and I love answering your cheese questions. If I don't know the answer, then I'll find out. That's for sure. Or I'll ask some of my friends on the internet um, and surely they'll be able to help out. Thanks very much for listening to the Little Green Cheese podcast. There's the outro music. So for our upcoming workshop dates uh, and recipes, they can all be found at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my ebook, which I mentioned before, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. And that's available in all ebook formats, in co- including a PDF, which you can print out. Uh, you can also find all of my cheese making YouTube video tutorials within the ebook or on my YouTube channel. Just go to the Little Green Cheese uh, blog to find the link to that. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next ex- ep- the, yeah the next exciting episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>